Hello everyone and welcome back to the fourth episode of the Urban Log webinar series. I'm A.V. Venugopal and I will be your Zoom host for the session today. It has been great to see the participation and conversations we've had over the last three episodes with over a thousand registrations in each session and even for today's session with participation from over 150 Indian cities and over 30 international cities. Thank you all for joining us today on Zoom and YouTube. We are discussing a very important and interesting topic in today's session on the investments for a green recovery in the transport sector. The format for the session today is largely conversational, similar to the last few episodes, addressing questions sent by you during the time of registration. We hope you find the session engaging and useful. On this note, a few quick housekeeping rules for everyone here. Participants and panelists, feel free to chat and interact with each other in the chat box throughout the discussion. You can type in your questions on the Q&A box below. Our team will shortlist these questions from YouTube and Zoom, and it will be raised during the Q&A session. And finally, if you have a question that you like a little more that's raised by someone else, you can upvote it and bring them to our attention. On that note, I'd like to introduce our moderator and first speaker for this episode, Ms. Shreya Gadapalli, South Asia Program Lead of ITDP. Over the last two decades, Shreya has guided the planning and design of public transport systems in over half a dozen cities in India. Her areas of expertise include the design of non-motorized transport infrastructure, multimodal integration, parking management, and people and transit-oriented urban planning. With that, over to you, Shreya. Uh, thanks a lot, Venu, for that uh, introduction. And it's fantastic to have you all uh, on this fourth episode of Urban Log. Today, like uh, Venu said, we're speaking about the question of money. And money is such an important question if we really want uh, anything to happen. And we have a fantastic panel today with us. Uh, we have Ms. V. Manjula. Uh, she's one of the senior most IAS officers that we have in our country. Uh, she's uh, in addition to being the Shreya, we can hear you now. We lost you for a few seconds. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, like I was saying, uh, we have... Uh, can we... <clears throat> Thank you. Can everyone see uh, the screen, please? Sure. So, uh, in addition to Ms. Me uh, Manjula, who is uh, the uh, Edition Chief Secretary of the Government of Karnataka, and also the, the longest serving commissioner of the Directorate of Urban Land Transport, and she's been one of the biggest champions of green mobility in the country. We also have with us uh, Mr. Rahul Kapoor, he's the director at the Smart Cities Mission at the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Uh, and he's again through the Smart Cities mission, uh, along with Mr. Kunal Kumar, spearheading the whole idea of green mobility across the whole country, about 100 cities that we have across the country. Uh, and we have with us uh, Gerald uh, from uh, the World Bank. He's the lead transport specialist who will also be a co-moderator of this session with me. And finally, we have uh, Laghu Parashar, who is a senior technical advisor at the uh, GIZ Smart SUT program in India. And uh, I've known Lagu for many years. Uh, it's been 15 years, I think, that I've known. And he's been a big champion of public transportation. He's worked extensively with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. So a fantastic panel. And uh, with that, let me get into uh, my presentation. Thank you. So uh, like I was saying, the, the main question that we are addressing today is uh, we have a COVID situation. The whole world has been taken by a storm with COVID. Uh, but it's also an economic, a question of our economy and how economic revival is going to happen in the country. And does this opportunity provide us, uh, does this provide us an opportunity uh, of a green or a gray revival? A green revival is one where we would have probably better public transportation, better walking and cycling facilities. Uh, and a gray revival would be, you know, going back to business as usual, uh, you know, having choked streets, polluted air, and so on and so forth. So with that, I'd like to uh, go forward. Uh, Venu, if you could take us to the first poll, please. Yes.
Venu, are you there? Uh, yes, Shreya, the poll is running. So we have responses coming in right now. So we have around 80% of the attendees who have shared their responses and I'll just try sharing the results with all of you as well. So what you see on your screen is where the responses were, where we had 75% of the respondents relating the term green mobility with streets for walking and cycling and close behind was at 11%, electric share two wheelers and three wheelers. So this is something which will be picked up later in the discussion by uh, Shreya and Gerald in the conversation. Shreya is still facing some technical glitches at her end. So I just had a quick call with her. So uh, can we have Mr. Mohammed Mazgani's presentation first while Shreya tries to get back online? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for, for, the, for the invitation. I'm very pleased to join this, uh, this discussion uh, and to share with you uh, the views of uh, UITP, the International Association of Public Transport on this uh, very uh, critical issue and in, in the context uh, of crisis we are all uh, living uh, these days. Uh, UITP is the International Association of Public Transport. It's, uh, it's a very old association. It, has, uh, it was uh, created 135 years ago in Belgium and is the association of uh, now 1,800 organizations, uh, public transport operators, supplying industry, and uh, of course, authorities and regulators, 1,800 uh, from, from uh, 100 countries. And uh, of course, this, uh, this uh, crisis uh, came with, uh, with a number of uh, impacts on public transport and on mobility. Uh, we have seen uh, 4 billion uh, inhabitants uh, uh, locked down, and uh, which has, uh, of course, uh, had a, a very, very uh, strong impact on their, on their mobilities. And I would like to, to share with you some uh, some some views or the impacts on the financial or, or on the finance and the financial issues related to this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So if we can move to the first slide, please. So the, first, the impact on uh, on revenues. So what we see, we see that passenger revenues have been dramatically hit from 60 to 90 percent, according to the networks. Most of them have, have stopped uh, ticket inspection, which uh, has led also to an increase in, in fare evasion. So passenger revenues have uh, uh, dropped uh, dramatically. Then the commercial revenues, uh, the commercial revenues have been affected, for example, or uh, property rent uh, in, 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 in some cases, like for example, uh, uh, in London, the commercial uh, tenants have been granted the rent holiday uh, those tenants in uh, public transport stations. Also, the activities such as advertising and uh, retail have also been directly impacted due to the drop in commercial activities with, uh, within stations. We see also similar outcomes uh, observed uh, due to the cancellation of uh, congestion charges like in uh, London or in Singapore, but also in many cities, uh, parking fees have been uh, lifted and so allowing free parking in, in cities. So this also uh, led to a reduction in revenues uh, related to, to mobility. Uh, we see also a, a similar dyna dynamic uh, from uh, allocated taxes or levies, such as, for example, the payroll tax or the property taxes uh, that are earmarked to public transport budget. You know, for example, in counties like in France, uh, the employers, they pay a tax uh, based on the, uh, on the number of employees and the, 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 the wages they, they, they pay every, every month. So they pay a tax which uh, fund public transport. And, for, and during this uh, crisis, it's the case in Brazil as well. So during this crisis, of course, this uh, transport levy is not collected and then the funding of public transport has, uh, is, is impacted by, by that. So these are the, the impact on revenues. When we look to the costs, uh, we see first one important impact is linked to the strengthening 
of cleaning and disinfection operations in public transport uh, systems uh, using different te techniques. This is, of course, needed to, to restore trust and to welcome back uh, uh, passengers, but it comes with a very high cost. For example, in, uh, in Paris, the public transport operator, RATP, uh, they has increased their disinfection budget from 90 million in 2000, 90 million euros in 2019 to 210 million euros in 2020. So more than doubling the disinfection and cleaning budget. Also imposing physical distancing uh, in public transport vehicles uh, means operating them uh, using only 20% of their capacity, which is the equivalent of only eight to 10 uh, passengers in a standard bus or one, uh, one person per square meter in, uh, metro, in metro vehicles. So, and this obviously leads to an increase in transport uh, supply and capacity with a corresponding additional cost to enforce the uh, physical distancing rule. So this is one important impact on costs. Then among the, the, the main variables uh, uh, from the uh, operational expenses, uh, also we, we, we see staff, of course, is, is, is one uh, key one, depends on the structure of the operating cost, of course, staff costs are very important. And uh, many uh, companies directly employ staff who either benefited from government job schemes or were suspended uh, partially or fully. A number of countries they have introduced uh, this, uh, what is uh, the so-called uh, uh, temporary unemployment, uh, which made the governments uh, uh, subsidize part of the uh, staff cost of uh, public transport uh, companies, not just public transport, but of, of companies and, and, and businesses, but this is only partially covered. So many operators had to Im implement layoffs and, and furlough. So other costs such as uh, interest and debt services undertaken by companies uh, to ensure operational activities will still have to be paid. Uh, uh, whereas depreciation and uh, contribution to capital project will have to be reviewed on a case by case basis to their, to, due to their significant contribution on, to a network investment. And as far as investments are concerned, some projects have been interrupted because of the sanitary requirements, of course, impossible to observe physical distancing uh, at the workplace or at, 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 uh, during work. So that was a reason to uh, suspend some of the projects. But we see also public transport uh, systems that uh, says the opportunity of the lockdown to, uh, and the slowing down of the operation to progress on, on works. Uh, for example, in New York, they have, uh, they have finished works that were planned for, they have finished three, three months ahead of what uh, of the calendar they had so so it this this crisis created an opportunity to progress on on works but uh, uh, also some cities they are considering those who have interrupted their investment actually they have considering to using investment budget to cover operational losses so if we go to the next slide please uh, so what about the recovery now and what about the yeah the fine the financial situation in relation to the to the recovery because uh, first, uh, we, we governments they they need to to, to take exceptional measures uh, to, to to support the public transport sector, and we have seen a number of governments that uh, have uh, take uh, the, some stimulus packages uh, to, to 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 support public transport companies and the supply chain industry. Uh, this is the case in the USA. The USA were the first country to to, to decide this kind of support with 25 billion US dollar. Uh, dedicated to, to public transport in Germany, 5 billion euros. Yesterday, Spain, they announced 800 million euros. So these, are, these measures are needed and they are not sufficient, I, I must say. Uh, but in, the, in most of the countries, fares is the sole uh, source of income. So without financial support from the government, the survival of public transport is really at stake. So when service contracts exist, uh, they should be reviewed by the public transport authorities to soften certain requirements, especially in this uh, crisis and transition, transitionary uh, period where, and, 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 and to, to, to consider co compensation. For example, uh, in Dublin, uh, the organizing authority has turned the operator's contract into a cost plus fee contract where the operating expenses uh, will be covered in addition to a flat rate remuneration. We see also other me measures like tax exemptions, support for liquidity and, and bonds, moratoriums on debt 
reimbursements or loans without interest to support the public transport uh, sector. Uh, and uh, this mechanism should also be made available to local uh, transport authorities, not just operators, because they are the ones often uh, that uh, bear the risk of uh, revenue losses. Uh, just give you an example of Turkey, where the income tax has been reduced from 25% to 1%, the VAT from 18% to 1%, uh, all tax and loan payments postponed by six months. Uh, we see also low changes are considered to let municipalities support the public transport sector. And despite all the support from operating companies or individual owners risk bankruptcy during this crisis. For example, in, in Istanbul, more than 80% of bus services, uh, including regular bus, uh, minibus and, and the company service uh, uh, shuttle are owned by operators, uh, are, I operate, are operated by individuals, sorry. So what will happen if they cease operation? So the support of informal transport is, is essential. Uh, due to the crisis, public transport has been suffering a deteriorated image uh, and the, the disaffection of travelers, of course, is, is, is likely to continue in the coming months if we don't restore trust. So it's important that we reassure travelers, and we have uh, we have we, we have seen uh, that uh, of course we can reassure them by cleaning, by disinfecting. But it's also important that we have hard facts showing that there is not uh, the risk is not higher in public transport uh, to get the virus compared to other public spaces, and there are more and more evidence. And 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 the last one was uh, was was. Uh, published yesterday by the uh, Singapore government showing that public transport when people don't talk to each other when people uh, wear masks the risk of catching the virus in public transport is very very low compared to other public uh, uh, spaces so it's important that uh, the media and the politicians stop promoting the use of cars as an alternative to public transport uh, this might damage the image of public transport of course uh, and also uh, making such recommendations uh, are, which are not based, ba based on hard facts is conducive to fear mongering. So we see even some political leaders calling people to drive more, uh, which is unacceptable, of course. And it's a very short-sighted view of, uh, the, the, of, 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 the, of the situation because coronavirus uh, will have a short-term effect, but uh, we need to think about the long-term effect. Uh, so we'll have, we, we, we should resist the temptation of short-term solutions in response to the present crisis that would encourage people to leap back to, into, into their, their cars. And we all know that ca car traffic nuisances like pollution, greenhouse gas emission, road accidents, congestion, they have not disappeared, unfortunately, with, with the crisis. So it's the right time to consider congestion charging, for example, uh, and, and, and better managed parking in cities and congestion charging could be a way of course, not just to organize or to restrict uh, traffic, but also to, to, uh, to collect funds uh, for public transport and sustainable mobility. And the last uh, aspect is that uh, we should not forget that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. So according to the World Health Organization, the poor air quality worsens the impact of the virus. So it's important that we take measures to reduce this uh, uh, poor air quality. And this is only possible by uh, promoting public transport by developing public transport and by making people uh, leave their cars. So uh, to conclude, I would say that the COVID-19 crisis should not make us lose sight of the persisting climate and ecological crisis. Therefore, we really need a Green Deal compatible growth. Thank you very much for, for your attention and I'm here to answer questions if, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohammed Mizgani. Um, thank you so much for sharing the international perspective on uh, the challenges that cities face and the uh, guidelines that cities should look at going forward. Back. So if you'd like, I could probably try, give it a try. Perfect, that's a great share. We can try sure. once again. Sure, can you start with the presentation after the, the poll? The fourth slide, please. Sure. Now, so uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ghani. Uh, it was uh, great to hear about what's happening across the world uh, and your words, strong words about how we need to look at the long term 
and uh, you know not take short term a short term view of things was excellent now to look at that like it's important that we first see what was happening with transportation in india uh, prior to the lockdown and based on the data from the census we see that a lot of trips were happening on foot on bicycle and on public transportation in indian cities and uh, if you can you go to the next slide please and while uh, the the overall graphics might represent broadly what the mode share of men trips might be male trips might be but when it comes to female trips the next slide please uh, women are extraordinarily dependent on walking and public transportation in indian cities and unless we make sure that walking and public transportation continue to be important uh, means of transportation uh, it it would be very difficult for women to have access to jobs uh, and opportunity education and opportunities going forward now uh, we also did uh, a, a very interesting survey and if you can go to the next slide please venu we looked at uh, both uh, job and education trips as well as other trips on how people might respond to uh, the covid situation and interestingly while a lot of people have been thinking about a dramatic drop in the use of public transportation even though there is a lot of uncertainty the drop in public transportation is probably going to be only of the order of about 20% that's what people are telling us right now um, this is for jobs and education and when it comes to other trips it's a very similar figure but what's very interesting is that despite the walking and cycling infrastructure being very poor in indian cities uh, there is going to be an uptick in the usage of walking or walk trips and cycle trips especially when you look at cycle trips uh, you can see that people are saying 48% increase in uh, the number of cycle trips that we might see in indian cities this was based on a survey of over 4000 respondents from across the country now if we go to the next slide please uh if you go to other trips uh, which are non job or non education we see that cycling trips might even increase by 65% and walk trips by 11% uh and the drop in public transportation is not going to be as dramatic uh, as many think so in this circumstance the question to ask is where do we put our investments and while we might see a nominal increase in two wheeler usage and car usage uh the question is can we accommodate these increases in in our transportation so the next slide please so we really need to look at what is the opportunity cost uh, you know with 1000 crores we might get about 2 kilometers of an elevated road uh, to or 2 and a half kilometers of an elevated road and similarly a 2 kilometers of an elevated uh, sorry for the text there but a 2 kilometers of uh, a metro rail system in the country which you know while it has done well in some individual lines in delhi and mumbai and kolkata uh, on the whole has not been serving as many people in indian cities and while in the longer term one might invest in metro maybe what we need to do if you can go to the next slide please venu is for the same 1000 crores we could probably get about uh for a 1000 crores we could get easily about 400 to 500 buses but potentially as many as 1000 buses which could serve twice as a little bit nearly about a million trips like 300 to 500 uh, million uh, 300 to 500000 trips every day or we could potentially get about 200 kilometers of complete streets uh, which could serve a half a million people or more every day so the question to ask is where is it that we will make our investments and we presently see that there is a big deficit in the number of buses in indian cities uh, we need something like 150000 buses but what we have is only about 35000 buses on the whole these are public city buses in our cities and we have practically no complete streets now a few cities like chennai and bangalore and pune have been creating extensive networks of walking and cycling but we need to see a dramatic rise of this across the whole country but that brings us to the question of where is the money and how can we bring the money to be invested in sustainable transportation the next slide please now the next few slides are uh, from gerald and gerald if you would like to uh, you know explain a little bit about what uh, you have to say about uh, you know the, the issue of uh, sure 
Sure, I, 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 I can come in. Yes. Comments as well as what kind of investments that you need to make. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think uh, to 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 build on what Mohammed was describing in the global uh, uh, you know uh, global context and go back to India. What we can see over a 12-month period, starting just as COVID started uh, to uh, one year later, is that there is going to be a combination of effects taking place. Um, there was a little bit of reduction in cost uh, during the uh, lockdown because some of the costs were not incurred. Overall, there is going to be a growing increase associated to uh, more maintenance and the like. There is certainly a very big drop in revenue uh, created by social distancing. And, you know, when we look at the situation of the STUs that do carry the bulk of, uh, uh, you know, uh, passengers in cities in particular, and we look at what will happen over a one-year period, we find that altogether you have about 40,000, 41,000 pro uh, that are going to be uh, lost uh, by, by the industry. And you know, just for, for Mohammed, that, that means uh, about $6 billion. And that's really very big uh, for, 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 for the, the STUs. Now, this is only for the public sector operator. When we look at the private sector operators, the, the loss associated with social distancing are going to be more of a magnitude of 125,000 crore. Uh, so, you know, uh, again, if you divide by seven, that gives you uh, uh, the number in the US dollar. Uh, so the numbers are very big and they are a jolting uh, impact on the industry. Next. When we then look at how the states are balancing their, uh, I mean, uh, allocating their resources, we can see that relatively speaking, and I just, pick up two, two states, but relatively speaking, the amount of money that goes towards bus transport, you know, is in the uh, three to 15% range. And compared to the entire allocation to the sector, it's a relatively small part compared to the uh, impact uh, on people and the number of users. Next, please. So it really, uh, uh, you know, bring a number of questions. The first question is, as we think through the mechanisms that are available to uh, you know, support the industries as we come out from the lockdown, is there an opportunity to increase some of the revenues, maybe through uh, some additional taxes? I know it's not necessarily going to be popular. Uh, some fuel charges that would essentially bring the liquidity you need now to cover some of the, uh, the, the costs of the recovery. The second one is really a strategy of rebalancing expenditure. And that uh, was alluded to by Mohamed in terms of reallocation within state budgets. Uh, it can be uh, across sectors or within sector towards uh, maybe a bit uh, less capital expenditure, more operating expenditure to re keep India moving and uh, restart the, uh, the economy. Or it can be a re reallocation within uh, city budgets as well, where cities take a broader role in terms of uh, uh, securing resources to ensure mobility through non-motorized transport and, uh, and, and, and bus services. Next, please. So back to you. Shreya? Yes, Gerald, thanks, thanks a lot. So, um, you know, the, the next two slides are again from our partner, uh, the World Bank and, and GIZ is the other partner in love who is there with us. And the primary questions that we have is, uh, but where are the funds? And the level of funding at the national level has been inconsistent. Uh, there has been a poor bankability of the STUs that we have. Uh, the revenue sources of ULBs are fairly limited. And finally, as a significant share of the budget goes towards road infrastructure, as Gerald just now showed, so what we need probably is a reform-based national fund bus funding program, uh, much like what we saw 10 years back when we had an economic uh, downturn and after which we had the NURM program pump in a lot of buses into cities. Uh, back then we had about 20,000 buses coming in, but now we are saying maybe we need 150,000 buses, not 20,000 buses. And similarly, uh, look at 
how uh, the, the money from state and ULB bus, uh, budgets should go towards public transportation and MT rather than put on road infrastructure as has been the case historically. And lastly, of course, we need to look at new revenue sources. Uh, you know, while congestion pricing and parking primarily are travel demand management measures, they can also be important sources of revenue. And therefore, maybe that's what cities really need to take hard decisions now and make sure that we get the money, which will be a win-win situation. Not only would we have lower usage of personal motor vehicles, uh, but have the money to invest in a green recovery. Next, please. So, like, uh, like uh, you know, we've already said, uh, we need well-developed public transportation systems, and we need great NMT infrastructure. And you know, these have many benefits. Of course, you know, the public transportation users or those who are on foot or bicycle already benefit from it. But it also improves the quality of air. And one of the things that we've all noticed uh, during the COVID uh, lockdown was is how much cleaner the air was. So you know, we need to also look at uh, pollution or cleaner air. Uh, safety risks, which we have road safety risks, and how we should reduce the number of uh, accidents, and how you know better ecosystem of walking, cycling, and public transportation can improve access to opportunities for people, so that they have that, so that you know they they have better opportunities, and the country as a whole uh, grows enormously. So you know, with that as an introduction, uh, let's go now to uh, you know the next part of our session and which is the panel discussion that we have uh, like i had said earlier we have a fantastic uh, list of panelists today and uh, we would have two parts to this panel discussion the first one is to look at how what we need to do in the immediate period the next 6 to 12 months for a recovery but also the second part of the discussion would focus on what is it that we need to do in the longer term and what kind of actions do we not need to start taking now so that in the longer term, we would have a green future. So over to you, Gerard, uh, to uh, take forward the first part of this panel discussion. And lastly, we would have a question and answer session. Uh, we know how important it is for all the participants that we have uh, to interact with the panelists. So we, we hope that we would have enough time for that interaction to happen as well. Over to you, Gerald. Thank you very much, Shreya. First, a uh, pleasure to be with all of you uh, today. Thanks to Smart City Mission for launching this series and uh, to ITDP, GIZ as a partners. Uh, you know, I want to start by saying that uh, the COVID cri crisis we are going through will really determine the future of uh, urban mobility, not only in the coming six months or one year, but in the coming decade. The, the way the industry reacts and adapts will really seal the long long term fate of how we move in cities. And you know we all have a role to play, whether government, private sector, citizens, and the like. In the past sessions, we really focused on what to do. You know the non motorized transport, uh, walkways, uh, cycle paths. Uh, the uh, standard operating procedure, uh, procedures that need to be put in place. And today we'll be focusing on funding and finance. And we, we are really fortunate to have a, a very rich panel uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, that panel uh, really covers uh, the national level uh, city, uh, national uh, level uh, administrators, state level, uh, the private sector, uh, banks uh, or, or technical uh, uh, assistance uh, partner of India, as well as uh, UITP as we started uh, earlier. So, you know, it's, it's really a, a broad panel that will give us a, a range of perspective. And I, I would really like to start with, uh, you know, the smart city uh, uh, mission representative uh, today with us, uh, Mr. Raul Kapoor, we are really delighted to have you, obviously, uh, you would not have launched uh, this uh, urban log series without thinking about how smart solution can be introduced uh, in cities to try to keep India moving. And, uh, you know, the first question to you, and we will be focusing, as Shreya said, on the next six months to 12 months. The first question to you is, what role do you see uh, the central government can play in triggering changes that will accelerate, uh, that will accelerate the recovery uh, keep India moving, 
and also set it on the right path. So, uh, Mr. Kapoor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Jaral. So, when we are looking at fostering of investments and the role of the government, I think that there can be four roles that the government normally plays, whether it's normal times or whether it's specific situation to COVID. The response may require a little bit of tweaking or changes, but I think fundamentally there are four key areas wherein the government needs to uh, basically help the industry and help the market. So I'll not go into the basics of why it's so important and what are the avenues, because what is the question that you start? So there are certain points that over there as well. But looking at it from a government's perspective, first, if there are four points, then first would be being technology agnostic. Now, you have a lot of investments. Uh, if you see the, the trends over the last 10 years, uh, there has been a shift. I mean, from a system wherein you had an asset-based model, wherein purchase of cars and uh, individual vehicles uh, were the basic business model in the mobility sector, it has more become a shared or a ridership-based model, wherein you have more of shared mobility, and according, the investment trends have also shifted in that pattern. So you see that a lot of investment has gone into something like an EV, something like, an, uh, like a shared mobility platform, things like Ola. And the second important trend that we see in the last decade that how investment mobility has shifted is that, that investment has moved into two key areas, both physical infrastructure and the digital infrastructure. With technology being at the forefront, you have a lot of uh, data coming in and how user experience or how uh, the overall efficiency of your public transportation or mobility systems in the city can be improved using data. So investments have gone into shared data infrastructure. So being tech agnostic, building the standards, this will have an impact on mobility innovations in your uh, country. So that is the first role that the government can play. Second would be fostering research and innovation in mobility because as we see that the trends are changing now and there will be a lot of innovation. So how do you foster that? The government can give the right signal. Which areas are you going to allocate your funds? How quickly policy decisions will be taken? Will give an impact or give you a signal to the market. So when the Smart Cities Mission decided to invest in integrated command and control centers or intelligent traffic management systems, it gave the right signal to the market that these are the areas wherein you need to innovate. These are the areas where you need to invest in. So accordingly, your venture capitalists or angel investors would try and promote startups in these areas. And that's how investment in these areas would be fostered. Third would be actually building the infrastructure to support new technology because new technology comes with a lot of costs. The costs have to be absorbed. And sometimes it is not very easy for industry to absorb these costs. So building infrastructure with regard to, let us say, if you're talking about EVs, then building the charging infrastructure, creating intelligent traffic systems like the integrated command and control centers in smart cities or having innovative models of financing for these projects. So innovation is the fourth thing and that innovation in procurement. So the fourth role that the government plays is that of a user. How do you innovate procurement, which is normally stippled in the government, especially with regard to procurement of new technologies, new innovations, because when you're talking about reviving green and uh, green technologies, then these are all new technologies and procuring of new technologies is normally a challenge in the government. So you also need to innovate your procurement models. There are things like giving an, a short offtake or an EOT model, wherein if you see in the rail transportation system, uh, the private partner is given an assurance that these are the minimum number of uh, equipments or vehicles that will be purchased uh, by the government. So these assured offtake procurement models can definitely help in uh, absorption of new technology. I think uh, these are the primary four areas that uh, the government can focus on. Great, great. So, so I mean, I think you see uh, clearly a role that is more of a uh, rethinking service delivery, rethinking the technology more than a financial support per se to the states to make it happen. Okay, that, that's, that's very useful to, to get from you. Uh, and so let me naturally now turn to the state. We, have, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, Ms. Manjula with us. She has a long track record of not only thinking about transport, but making it happen, you know, transforming uh, Karnataka through the ULT. And, you know, my question uh, uh, to you, Ms. Manjula, is we are in a very deep crisis uh, from a financial standpoint. What response do you see the states providing to that challenge uh, so that, you know, we keep uh, India moving, we keep Karnataka moving and your many cities? Um, so, um, initially you asked about some short-term uh, strategies or, uh, you know, investments. 
uh, for Karnataka has actually given some, uh, you know, short term support to the public sector operators that we have here who operate the bus services in uh, our cities. And uh, we are also looking, uh, working with community to look at, uh, you know, whether we can leverage this situation like many cities have done to promote uh, the you know, use of cycling. See, many of our uh, cities, we do not really have such a high mode share. So uh, we are, you know, talking to the community and trying to, uh, you know, work with them to plan for the cycling infrastructure. Uh, but, you know, these are all uh, very temporary kind of initiatives. And if I must say that, you know, we have started the bus services now and people are, you know, kind of getting into the buses. It's not that like because of staggered seating and all, definitely the capacities have reduced, but it's a temporary thing. Uh, so while we could react to this situation by, let us say, pumping in some subsidies, etc., or supporting the bus services, uh, we need to have a long-term perspective, definitely. And that is what is needed to, uh, you know, not a knee-jerk kind of a reaction. We could react and take advantage of the situation, but we, knew, we need to take advantage of the situation to put in some long-term policies. Now, I just want to go back on this to the JNNURM reference that Shreya has made. So in JNNURM at that time, it was also used as a tool or an instrument to uh, fo uh, foster reforms. And uh, our own experience has been that when, as a part of these reforms, we had set up a state urban transport fund in the state, basically to comply with the JNNURM norms. But we have been able to continue with it and have been able to leverage that fund to actually uh, promote or introduce uh, city bus services in 18 new cities. So the 18 new cities which never had city bus services were able to get city bus services in the last eight years or so of this SUTF uh, operation. And in addition, we have been able to leverage it to you know, build terminal infrastructure, depot infrastructure, apart from actually funding portion of the BRTS project in Hubli Darwar. So what I feel is that there should be a consistent source, there should be a continuous source of funds, and that source can be used to utilized as a means, as, as an instrument to kind of, uh, you know, make the operators, make the states or make all the agencies involved to think of reform. So reform will come as it's like a characteristic kind of a thing. If you say I'm going to fund roads, but you need to have footpaths and cycle cycle tracks as a part of this road that I'm funding, definitely all the local uh, state governments who want to finance, who want finances, who want funds, would fall in line because they would definitely want that. So using funding as a source of you know reform, as a source to push reform, is important. And uh, just very quickly, two more points: when we are talking about financing, we should not simply look at financing infrastructure. We need to look at financing capacity building because to my mind more than funds and i feel uh, if you really mind we can find funds but we need capacity building both at the individual and institutional level and that is what is important and communication and awareness because it's not important to talk about only cycling infrastructure we need to have people neighborhoods communities ready to do use that infrastructure so all these go hand in hand so i will stop here and maybe uh, react again after uh, the other uh, panelists also react. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And, and, and I think I really like the way you connect the you know, need for action now with the need to think about the reform and the transformation, right? I mean, because this is, we know that in, in India, you do have a lot of work to be done to bring urban mobility to where India needs it to be, you know, to serve the needs of the vision for 2030. And that's going to require much more you know, bus capacity, integration, shared mobility and the like, and we'll be discussing it in the second round of, of question. I like also the fact that you mentioned your SUTF, which is one of the most successful fund of this kind in India, and for a decade has been providing, I think, something like 80 crore per annum, right? So so, so it's, it's actually pretty substantial. Uh, so thank you very much. Let me turn to uh, a perspective which I'm sure will be a bit different. Uh, by turning to uh, uh, Mr. Prasanna, who is president of the Bus and Car Operators Confederation of India. I'm sure the financial squeeze the operators are faced with today must be really difficult. So what do you see as the set of solutions uh, moving forward, uh, Prasanna? 
Uh, Gerald, this is Venu here. I think Mr. Prasanna has uh, dropped off the call due to some technical error. So while he comes back, probably we can continue. Then, the then, then, then I, will, I will turn to, uh, to Lagu. Uh, Lagu, uh, you have been working for a long, long time on the challenges of mobility in, uh, in India. And uh, I mean, now uh, as a senior technical advisor for GIZ, uh, what do you see at, as what could be done in the next uh, you know, uh, 12 months? to uh, get uh, India to move again. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jalan. Uh, so uh, I would uh, I would not say that in the next 12 months, probably we have to do a lot of long term uh, when it comes on finance. So as you talk about, we are in a situation, financial situation because of uh, the, the distancing norms and whether other cost implications we will have eventually. Uh, but if you if you just look at the historical data which you also presented, uh, uh, we were never be in a good situation when it comes on financing in, in urban transportation. So close to twenty thousand crore uh, uh, rupees of loss across the STUs, annual loss across the STUs, and despite that, this is just the financial loss of the existing fleet. And where the, as the share was talking about, we have a fleet deficit of one fifty thousand buses, urban buses in India. So to bridge this gap technology upgradation, then further uh, uh, facilitating the infrastructure for active mode like pedestrianization and, uh, and the cycling, we were always in the need of financing. Okay, And somehow we were postponing it for a long, long time. But now I think, uh, as you said, our future of the city will be decided by uh, future of our uh, transit system, which are going to choose whether we are going to promote the active modes or we are going to the people who are leave, who may leave the public transport system might leave might go to the cars. So now this is the time we cannot can no longer wait and we have to decide uh, one thing on the long term financing strategy. So uh, I think uh, at this at, let's discuss at a two level at a national level at a state. Lagu, I think we lost you. Time and you know uh, we have heard from uh, the national uh, level, we have heard from the state, we have heard from uh, uh, GIZ. Let me turn back to uh, Mohammed. Uh, I think you you painted a, a a global picture with quite a lot of government taking action. Uh, what do you see based on you know what you heard from our colleagues from India uh, as a next step that India could be considering in terms of what you do now? for the next 12 months uh, recovery. Mohamed? Thank you, Gerard. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm not in the, I'm, I would not dare to recommend anything for India because they don't need, they don't need my recommendation to progress further. Uh, I will just, uh, uh, let's say, I, I heard very interesting uh, 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 input and, uh, and then I would like to come back on what uh, Ms. Manjula uh, just uh, shared because I like the approach of uh, using funding as a source to push reform, uh, uh, and and this is I think the right the right approach, and we can even uh, push this approach further, and uh, for example, uh, not just uh, link funding to uh, the introduction of uh, uh, of of infrastructure for pedestrians or for cycle lanes, but uh, uh, we see in some cities uh, that if you want to get funding uh, you have first to have a sustainable urban mobility plan which is well defined and which is uh, uh, also uh, defining the place we want and the importance we want for each mode also if you want to have funding you must have an uh, institutional reform which will lead to the creation of a public transport authority for example because one of the issues i think in india and i allow myself to say that uh, is the lack of integration between modes. And we see that, of course, metros are managed or are supervised by a ministry. Buses are supervised by another ministry or another authority. I, at the end, it's not, an, it's not a problem to have different ministries involved. But what is important is to have at the local level uh, an integration between the different modes. And if we manage these modes separately, the the citizens will suffer and the mobility will suffer and the, the travelers will suffer because they will have to, they don't have integrated ticketing because they don't have integration between the timetables of the different modes or between in the stations and themselves between the different modes. 
And so we need to look at the, at the problem from the user's perspective. I think that's very important and not necessarily from the uh, perspective of the institutions. Uh, so that would be my, uh, uh, my comment at this, at this stage. Thank you. So, so Mohamed, I think these are very well taken uh, comments in the sense that, yes, linking funding to sustainable mobility is going to be quite essential. I think it's going to be even more essential when you think about the next phase of reinventing where the cities can go, what India can become in terms of sustainable urban mobility can be defined now by, you know, rethinking about the paradigm and making adjustments as they see fit based on the lessons learned. So that's really important that push for reform that, you know, both uh, you and Ms. Manjula uh, echoed. And the institutional reform ultimately is also very uh, key point in the sense that if you don't have somebody who helps steer the transformation, it's not going to happen. We know it from everywhere else. And it's too many parts without, you know, a, a kind of steerer right now uh, in the Indian context. So uh, very good points. I see Lagu reconnected and I would like to get back to uh, Lagu. Uh, can you hear us, Lagu? Yeah, Gerald, I can hear you. Sorry. Uh, probably the technology is not in favor of us today. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> something is coming out. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I was talking about uh, the financing part. We, it is like looking at the our historical situation also, we were always requiring that for those kind of finances for technology upgradation, for bridging our losses which is are in the range of 20,000 crore rupees and uh, to keep the public transport affordable and to invest into this uh, cycling and the pedestrian infrastructure. So uh, uh, while national level, of course, we need, uh, we need to have a long-term scheme which can provide more, more and more choices to the cities in terms of selecting the transit technology and uh, not only on the metro, but uh, it gives the cities to other choices also in terms of buses and uh, in terms of uh, BRTS and other systems. But uh, I think uh, at a state level, uh, they need, they have to find out uh, 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 the sources, the new sources to bridge these financial gaps and to invest continuously in the upgradation of infrastructure. So one of the example, I think Ms. Manjula was talking about the Karnataka Urban Transport Fund. The similar uh, two example I would like to uh, uh, just uh, explain over here is like one in Rajasthan and other is in Punjab. So uh, similar to the Karnataka in 2010, as a part of the reforms program, Rajasthan created a Rajasthan Urban Transport Infrastructure Development Fund. Uh, it was uh, created through executive order, a simple executive order. And uh, there, are, there are basically two financing sources uh, for that. One is the CES on the motor vehicle registration, and other is the CES on the stamp duty of the properties, and which goes to the directly from, uh, to, go to, goes to the consolidated fund of the state. So I have some uh, recent uh, collection, which are uh, mind blowing, I would say the numbers. In 1718, under this fund, they collected 417 crore rupees. Okay. And in 1920, in the collection was 510 crore rupees. So the thing is that we have few good example, which we can replicate in our state and our respective cities. Okay, and all these have taken into the consideration as was Shia was talking about that who is getting bene who are the be ultimate beneficiary of the system, whether it is not only the public transport user who's get getting benefited out of it, it is the non user also getting benefited out of it. So they are supposed to compensate the cost, uh, which is going to be incurred in the in these kind of investment. Second example is the Punjab. Uh, so Punjab is different because uh, it was created as uh, as under the act, unlike uh, the Rajasthan, which was executive order. So in 2019, September, it is a very, I think the newest fund. It was created uh, under the Punjab Urban, as a Punjab Urban Transport Act. And uh, I don't have the collection uh, revenue so, uh, numbers right now, but the sources I could see are 10 pesa per liter on petrol and fuel, uh, on any kind of fuel uh, at the last point of sale uh, at the fuel station. And as you know, in Punjab, people pay a lot on the vanity number plates of, for their cars uh, as part of auction. They give huge amount, even the, sometimes the cost of number plate is higher than the cost of cars. So, uh, so they utilize this uh, as an opportunity and they impose 10% 10, 10 of the final auction price will go to this fund. 
so these are the two very good example which i think worth replicating uh, by the cities for long term uh, uh, fund requirement for the investment in public transportation and the active modes this is something which i would like to highlight thanks excellent uh, lagu and you know i think uh, all of you have highlighted uh, the need for new sources of funding the need to fit into a vision the need to have institutional changes to, to link funding uh, as a source of pushing reform. So it's a very good segue to uh, the second set of questions. Let me turn to uh, Shreya at this point. Uh, thanks a lot, Gerald. Um, before uh, we go into the next section of the session, we actually have another small little poll. And uh, Venu, over to you. Could you please uh, run the poll? Uh, sure, sure. So the poll is live and it's visible to everyone. So like last. So time. as you can see, there are, uh, you know, the question is about what do you think is the main reason stopping Indian cities from implementing green mobility initiatives? And, you know, while you might say all of the above, I do really want you to think about what is that one thing which you think is the highest uh, point or most important point that is stopping Indian cities from implementing green initiatives. So we have, uh, lack of vision or misplaced priorities. Uh, it might be a question of money or the inability to plan and implement and poor coordination between agencies. And that's one thing that we've seen in India that there are uh, there's a multiplicity of agencies. So, you know, which of these do you think is the biggest cause? We have 60 percentage of the attendees who have responded, and there are, there are more responses coming in. So we can probably we wait. wait for another five seconds, five, six seconds, and then we can close the poll. It is tough to select one. I understand. But that's the whole <laughs> point, you know, the, that it's always these tough decisions which matter. Yeah, yeah. So tough for the audience now to select. <clears throat> Uh, we have more polls coming in, uh, more responses coming in, but it's 70 percentage response and stopping the poll right now. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks a lot for running it. And thanks, thank you all uh, who have answered. And these are, uh, what do you think um, are the answers, right? You think the biggest glitch is in misplaced priorities followed by poor coordination, third, inability to implement finally insufficient money. Which brings back to the question, we always think it's the money which is missing, but in reality, maybe it's not the money which is the <coughs> problem. It's many of the other issues like the priority or the coordination which is holding us back. Uh, I don't know whether Prasanna Patwardhan is back on the call. Uh, Renu, can you tell me if he is? Sure, sure. I'm stopping the sharing of the poll itself. And, uh... He has not uh, rejoined the session, uh, Shreya. I'll, I'll drop you a message in the chat thread in case he's able to join back. Sure. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd probably go back uh, to Mohammed. You've seen what the poll says, and maybe there's an element of truth to it. Do you have some reflections on the poll results? And then probably say, you know, what is it that Indian cities uh, need to do in the longer term to make sure that we have green mobility rather than gray mobility or gray investments. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. First, I'm happy of the result of the poll because I was afraid that people will select money as, uh, as uh, the reason for not uh, 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 progressing or not doing things. And often we see this. We see that people, they either select money they, they, or cultural differences. You know, many people, they, they hide behind, you know, oh, we are not as in Singapore or we are not as in Japan or as in, 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 in France or UK. So uh, we are different. So these solutions don't apply to us. And I'm happy to see that it's not because of the money, but because of the, of, uh, I mean, the other reasons. I'm not surprised of the other reasons. And we were discussing earlier about the, 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 the lack of integration or, uh, or the... Uh, uh, the, 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 I don't remember the last one, the last one in the list because I, I selected the last one in the list. I, I don't, I, okay. Uh, so, 
So it's it's uh, yeah, this this aspect uh, are important, I think. Uh, and and I, I would like to make the link to to your the second part of of, of your question: How uh, how shall we do to uh, uh, to have this green mobility? Uh, I think is to, have to 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 approach transport from the perspective of the people. That's the the the, the approach. I mean, transport is not an engineering issue. Uh, is not about uh, is not uh, is not a technical issue. Is a political issue and is 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 an, is a, is a people's uh, a people's centered issue. So it's important that we put ourselves in the shoes of those who will be traveling. They want to travel door to door. So it's important that we we, we put ourselves in their shoes and 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 see how they can travel. And if there is no no if we cannot offer a solution door to door. A solution means a combination of different modes, of course. Huh? So if we cannot offer a solution door to door because of the administrative issues, because of the institutional obstacles, then uh, we, are, we, are, we are not, uh, we are not uh, uh, offering the right solution. So this is very important to, uh, to, to, to think door to door, to think door to door. And first then to have a hierarchy of modes working, of course, and we know that in India, people walk a lot, but do they have the right infrastructure for walking? Can they walk safely? So walking should, ha should have the priority because if people can walk safely, they will not think about other modes, of course, within, a, within an acceptable distance and, and, uh, and, and cycling then, and then public transport and then cars. So uh, it, it, this is really the, it's important to have this hierarchy of modes and when I say public transport, it's also the shared modes, not just mass transit, but also all on-demand and shared modes should be integrated with, with public transport. So this would be my, uh, my, uh, my, my, my approach. And I see that one of the, uh, of the, uh, the participants of the uh, attendees just put this hashtag, move people and not cars. Yes, exactly. This is about moving people and not cars. And we know that cars, uh, they, 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 I mean, in the, in the photo you put earlier with the metro system, and, and, and the congestion and the traffic congestion, you put only three people in the metro, but the cars, uh, a congestion of cars. But if you look to this cars, you will see in each car, there is only one person traveling maybe. So it's important that we, we think people, we don't think vehicles. Thank you. Sure. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll probably move uh, to Ms. Manjula. Uh, Ma'am, you've been uh, at the forefront of pushing for sustainable mobility the state of Karnataka and like like I'd like you to reflect on the results of the poll which says that the main reason why things aren't happening is a lack of vision. Now there is certainly no question that people like you have the vision but where is the gap then if the lack of vision like at least from you the vision is coming what uh, is it stopping uh, changes from happening? Uh, see, uh, the vision has to be a shared vision. See, and that is where I again and again feel capacity building. And when I say capacity building, I also mean, uh, see, uh, capacity building of everybody from political class to the people who are actually executing a particular project. That is important. So vision cannot be one person's vision because in a democracy, people, you know, different classes of people take uh, there are people who take a decision, there are people uh, who frame for policies or who recommend policies, and there are people who actually execute them. So all, all these rungs are important. And there is a change. I do see a change over a period of time. And I just want to give two examples. Uh, one example was about the footpaths. Tender shore is a concept which has been implemented in uh, Bangalore, where road space has been taken and footpaths have, uh, footpaths have been widened. Initially, everybody said, uh, why? Why are you taking away the road space? And, uh, you know, already there is congestion. And, uh, you know, why are you doing it? And there are not many people to, who are walking, et cetera, et cetera. And today, that has become a demonstration project. And uh, what we see is that people, uh, politicians also from other cities, are actually insisting that we plan and uh, deliver infrastructure on the tender shore model. So it takes time, uh, and but you know people have uh, seen it, seen the impact of it, and understood that uh, you know th that has value, 
not from a perspective of only uh, you know in terms of a non motorized transport etc etc in, ter in, ter in terms of political visibility also about you know having delivered something which is uh, uh, which is uh, you know state of the art etc so they they see a value in that so that is one example the second example is more about the uh, you know the communication and awareness um, related we had a program called cycle day which was conceptualized by dult along with the community and which is an open street event and is going on for last 6 years where we uh, in neighborhoods community associations come forward and block a road for uh, non motorized transport active transport and for using that space as public space initially when we started the police were not even wanting to block the road they don't didn't want to give the permissions and it was a big task to convince them to give permissions for blocking the roads and now they are very happy and the more cooperative i wouldn't say like they are more cooperative more receptive to the idea of you know blocking a street and uh, only few days back the police commissioner came with us and uh, kind of agreed with an idea of having a i mean 17 odd kilometers cycle lane to be put up in one of the busy roads so there is a change of attitude and that happens uh, when you know along with the vision we also have capacity building in terms of not just training but in terms of demonstration uh, but things take time but i am quite optimistic that uh, we are there and we would be uh, maybe we are a bit delayed but we are reaching there and it is a process it, this is change of the priorities and all that it's not some uh, you know it is a process and everybody has to go through this process and that is where i feel the leaders in urban transport planning training which uh, you know government of india had as a part of sctp also played a very very important role because many of the city uh, managers got exposed to what kind of planning that they, they need to think about and uh, you know deliver so along with the first point of vision i would say ability to plan and implement is also important and uh, i feel uh, you know once we are able to plan implement something initially may we may face resistance but soon it becomes an example and that is what we need successful examples that can be replicated thank you thanks a lot uh, and may i ask you a follow up question as an as, you know what you mentioned is very heartening to know that the police is coming together and multiple stakeholders are coming together to probably go towards a shared vision and not just one person's vision uh, but do you see this vision being shared also by the political class that's a constant question that we are seeing on the feed but what about politicians are they coming along because one of the things that we see again and again in multiple indian cities is that while uh, we see a few good things happen like like tender show streets in bangalore Uh, we have uh, over 100 kilometers of complete streets in chennai we've been working closely with the corporation of chennai for many years pune is also implementing and one of the good things about pune is that it has made a commitment and has consistently put more than 50% of its budget uh transport budget onto walking cycling and public transportation improvements uh you know specifically walking cycling and bus improvements in the city now how do we get what pune is doing across the whole country how do we get a few kilometers or few tens of kilometers of tender shore roads which have been done in bangalore to be across all of karnataka because what we need is not 10 kilometers or 100 kilometers our estimates tell us that india needs somewhere between 30 to 40000 kilometers of complete streets so how do we scale up because we don't have time you know at the end of the day the 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 competition that we have from the motor vehicles uh industry if you will or the the need for motor vehicles is is acute and we again and again see demands coming for having steel flyovers and things like that across the whole country what do we do um see what we are trying to do is to carve out so out of this experience of running the sutf uh we came with an idea that we should have a uh, you know dedicated society with all stakeholders which is focusing only on non motorized transport so this is the karnataka non motorized transport agency that has been very very recently formed and uh, we are now putting some funds with the uh, with this agency to again promote and nudge basically you know uh, 
the kind of funds required for improving infrastructure have to come from the cities themselves uh, from you know when they raise their resources when they take up their various projects they to they need to set apart some funds for non motorized transport just as pune did at the state level what we think we should do is nudge the cities to think in that manner by again offering them some funding some design support and some hand holding so this is what we are trying to do so we feel that with this kind of a support in terms of hand holding design support and also in terms of some funding it's not full funding but some partial funding we would be able to kind of um, you know kind of impress upon the city authorities to start planning and implementing uh, you know uh, good uh, pedestrian infrastructure see it should be good quality pedestrian infrastructure project rather than some kind of a broke uh, discontinuous kind of infrastructure so we think that way we can kind of impress upon the city authorities to plan implement gain experience and uh, you know further expand on that and i'm quite sure when politicians see a good thing happening they would definitely not uh, uh, you know oppose it i don't think they would oppose it just like that it's it's a question of uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, convincing them with a with a with a coherent uh, vision and with a proper explanation if it, if that happens they will definitely support and the example i have is that of our own brts project in hubli darwar i don't think we would have implemented it without any political support we did have let like, certain problems but we also had some political support that came in our way so uh, i think we we are trying this way to nudge the cities to move forward thank you thank thanks a lot um i'll i'll go over to mr rahul kapoor now uh, mr kapoor uh, you have been working in the smart cities mission for the last many years and you have a good sense of where cities are across the whole country you know there are 100 cities which are part of the mission what do you think is stopping cities from implementing green mobility solutions we even heard in one of the previous episodes from uh, uh, your colleague mr kunal kumar that the smart cities funds itself could be used for that work uh, and we've seen again and again that it's the national government which really sets the tone for cities you know we've seen in uk the national government has announced a 2 billion dollar a 2 billion pound uh, program for non motorized transportation of which 250 million pounds would be immediately released similarly we've seen uh, the new zealand government do something similar what do you see foresee as being this transformative change how do we make that happen so uh, shreya it's a very good point actually if you look at it when you ran that poll and the general consensus was that all those points were actually very important it's not about vision it's also about coordination it's also about finances it's uh, also about actually having that capacity like what manjula madam just uh, talked about behavior change again is very important i mean there are smart cities that uh, undertook some of these green mobility projects non motorized transport projects active mobility projects you had public bike sharing in many of the cities you had complete streets pedestrianization but at the end of the day some models were successful and there were certain uh, challenges or probably the assets that were built were not optimally utilized so you have public bike sharing probably in delhi but we all know that how many of us would be very comfortable at least in many of the stretches to use public bike sharing probably safety is another concern uh, which needs to be addressed when you are designing such solutions so it's a learning curve i mean uh, i see a very positive uh, impact going forward especially with this covid situation which has actually given us an opportunity to reprioritize how do we want to look at uh, transportation and especially uh, urban transportation so i see that change is going to happen but behavior change as ma'am had uh, told in her address you look at it how it got done in some of the successful models for example in karol bagh there was a lot of resistance in new delhi but subsequently that entire street of ajmal khan road got pedestrianized and it became quite popular and when people start seeing these positive effects then definitely the acceptance uh, increases things like rahagiri which has uh, become a phenomenon in many other cities as well now these are the ways uh, in which uh, things will be changing in the future and i think organizations like ittp like uitp etc the kind of uh, full awareness building that is happening because of that is probably going to ch- redefine the way uh, we function the kind of urban transportation or city uh, mobility plans that we build in future 
So uh, that's what I think is uh, going to change. So with Smart Cities mission, I think many of the cities are looking at uh, building a mobility plan for the cities, which probably was not there in uh, in the past in many of the cities. So I guess that's how the demonstrations will happen. The lighthouse effect of smart cities, wherein some successes will be replicated by the other 4,400 urban local bodies, and that transformation will begin to happen. Sure, thank you. So, do I take it that uh, you know over the next few months, you know, given that we have this opportunity, that we could have an intensive capacity development program, you know, which ITDP, the World Bank, uh, GIZ, and all of us could, and UITP could come together with the smart cities mission. Uh, and get cities to not only rethink how they do things, but uh, give them the tools to implement it as well. So there's there are two sides to the capacity building, right? So there's so capacity yeah. building to open up minds and capacity building to give the tools to implement. So do you see that happening? And if so, how? In fact, we'd be looking forward to it. I mean, uh, it is definitely the need of the R, and I'm sure that there's nobody today who would refuse such an opportunity to basically re-envision re things in the city. So definitely, it is something that uh, the mission would be happy to consider. Sounds good. Uh, Benu, uh, just a time check. Uh, could you tell us um, if Mr. Prasanna Patwardhan is there on the call uh, because I, I do want to get a private sector perspective as well on the call. Um, sure, unfortunately, he has not been able to uh, reconnect uh, to the session uh, because of a technical issue at his end. So we can probably go ahead without him right now. Okay. Uh, Lago, uh, I'd like to ask of you a question uh, here. You know, you work with the government, but you also have extensive experience um, engaging with private sector as well. Um, and, and we know that the majority of public transportation in India is still privately operated, often informal in nature. Would you like to reflect on that and what kind of a reform agenda could be there and what kind of investment or financing is required for that reform agenda to happen? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Tough question uh, to say, actually. At, at the same time, you are right, because uh, if you look at our tier two and tier three cities, uh, their majority of the mobility is dependent on these uh, uh, IPT and paratransit. Uh, so not uh, unlike other bigger cities, the, even the bus transportation is not available in many of the cities. So somewhere we need to have uh, some kind of a uh, reform uh, program for these modes also, especially uh, when they are we are the prime mode of uh, mobility in in in, uh, in a tier two and tier three cities, but at the same time in bigger city they are also playing a role of first and last mile collectivity, and uh, they are also uh, serving uh, serving those area which are not connected by uh, our mass transit options. Uh, so far, I have not seen any program uh, on as far as financing of uh, 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 this informal sector, especially. But yeah, this is uh, this could be an opportunity uh, probably. Uh, when we we are we are expecting them to follow the social uh, distancing norms digital uh, payment platform and those those are the things which we are expecting them which might affect their revenue but let's say a program like delhi delhi is currently supporting the cities uh, supporting these uh, auto rickshaws for providing some 5000 or 6000 rupees per month probably if we are making some kind of a this financial support this could have been linked with kind of a uh, few reforms which could be expected from the from these uh, uh, informal sector so bringing them into uh, 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 integrating them with our systems in terms of digital payment platform in terms of information system and uh, against that whatever the funding support is being provided to them so this could be the, probably this uh, pandemic or situation the crisis situation which we are dealing with could be an opportunity for this Thank, thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've seen, and it's unfortunate that Mr. Patwardhan is not there on the call, that uh, the entire private sector uh, operation, so to speak, both informal and formal, has, has been very, very badly hit. And the question now is, would there be a scheme to bring them up on their feet so that they could resume operations, but also use the opportunity for a reform and that would actually be the uh, the topic of our next session, both from uh, the, a digitization and fare collection systems, but what kind of incentives could go towards uh, the reform of the informal uh, public transportation sector? 
So, Ashna, if I can ask you, maybe you could release the, the application for the next uh, session now so that those of uh, you who are there on this uh, session would register for it. But I'd, I'd uh, you know, I'd like to go back to uh, Mr. Mezgani again uh, before I start taking some questions from uh, the participants. What do you see as being the principal difference between maybe a European context uh, versus a, a global South context? What could we do to make public transportation better? What's the role of the private sector in this? I think the main, the main. Uh, I, I, I will not. I will not uh, make the opposition between European and non-European. Uh, I think there are counties with ha who have a maturity of public transport, or which are more mature in terms of public transport than other countries. And these counties could be in the south or in the in the, in the north. They are not. Uh, it's not the, the the exclusivity of the north to be mature in public transport. Sure. sure. And 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 I would say that the main difference really it's. Uh, it's the uh, the regulatory framework and the uh, the the way we we consider public transport uh, because the more importance we give to public transport uh, and the more uh, and, and 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 the more equipped will be the the the, the institutions to deal with that and uh, so as i said earlier i said earlier public transport is not a technical issue it's not an engineering issue Engineering and, 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 and the technical aspect are, are the, 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 let's say, the way we implement, are the answer to, to the way we implement it. But first, we have to define, we have to, uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, endorse it as a priority in our transport policy. And this is very important. Uh, it, public transport should not be only for those who have no choice. And that's the main difference. Often in the, in the less developed countries or in the and sometimes even some developed, but uh, they they, do, they consider public transport as the the, the 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 solution for those who have no choice, and and in more mature counties in terms of public transport, they consider that everyone uh, must uh, must uh, can use public transport. It's not the is not the the uh, the exclusivity of the poor people, and that's the import, that's important. And if we have this kind of approach, then we will easily decide dedicate the infrastructure for public transport and to have exclusive lanes for public transport uh, and 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 not uh, having uh, buses stuck in traffic because if we have buses stuck in traffic of course people will, will not be attracted by, the, by to take public transport so it's it's the priority we give to this to this mood and as as i said earlier i mean if you take 50 cars in 50 cars you will have 50 people or or 60 people traveling or 70 people if if and and these 70 people is 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 what you what you can carry in a bus, uh, so 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 in terms of space, in terms of of, of pollution, in terms of uh, of safety, in terms of uh, uh, impact on 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 people, public transport is much more uh, offers much more benefits. So that's the the it's recognizing that public transport is beneficial and not public transport not considering public transport as a burden. This is the main difference between. The, the diff the this country so okay. sure thank you thank you. Uh, I'd like to now take some questions from uh, the participants uh, we have a, a few questions here and uh, what I'd like some of them are anonymous but let me uh, go back to uh, miss Manjula uh, there is a threat potentially that the car industry uh, in India might receive a massive bailout. And even though only 5% of people in India actually use cars, in urban India use cars, and more than 70% of people are walking, cycling, or using public transportation, what is it that we can do to make sure that the bailout doesn't go to uh, the car industry, but instead is focused more on the bus industry and making sure that uh, we have walking and cycling investments? Because we need it's to... not just about doing uh, good things, it's also about stopping the bad things, right? I think we need to lobby hard. <laughs> the car industry must be lobbying too much for uh, such a bailout to be given. 
so i think the public transport uh, or you know both private public transport players both in private and public and everybody else who who believes in public transport all of us have to join hands and lobby hard uh, this is one thing which i could never understand that you know we we need to also have a consistent uh, kind of a vision so we can't have one department of uh, the state promoting cars and the other department talking about public transport so we need to have a single uh, you know kind of a you know policy so that we uh, we know we everybody is talking about it uh, not you know one department talks does something else and another department does something else so i think the answer to this is we need to all uh, you know come together and lobby hard and uh, with the which our department is the the, gov the government which uh, government of india probably the road transport or uh, the surface transport department uh, ministry which may be thinking about it or the industries department i don't know so we need to lobby hard with them okay and uh, you know what about at the state level what do we need to do because eventually uh, what matters is how much the finance department makes the allocation to each of the departments right and consistently and the, we've seen in multiple states that uh, it's it's the roads or the highways department which gets the largest allocation even in urban areas no with respect to your earlier question about the you know the the cars getting car industry getting a bailout etc um so what the states can probably do is you know make it more expensive for purchase of cars and uh, you know uh, start with higher parking charges etc so, so that it becomes as a disincentive uh, towards uh, you know owning a car so that is where one can kind of try to offset to that um, in terms of um, funding public transport yes we definitely all of us require uh, you know or would want more funds for public transport but i think at this point of time all states are also finding or uh, in a a very delicate kind of a financial situation where they are trying to balance many things probably at this point of time we if we look at priorities maybe health will would be the topmost priority but i am quite sure right uh, the all this uh, the, at, at least speaking um, from karnataka we are uh, you know looking very seriously at how to uh, you know kind of compensate or how to support the public transport uh, um, operators in our state um it's it's still work in progress probably as uh you know financial condition improves more funds will flow into the public transport but right now we are asking at a, a time when you know all of us are looking at how to further strengthen our hospital system so it may be very a little difficult to answer now uh, this question of uh, how we would uh, you know channelize more funds into public transport but that that is definitely a priority and uh, it is something which is being considered very very seriously thank you uh, and i'll probably take uh, uh, the last question we are already past 90 minutes right now of the session and maybe uh, some last words first from mr rahul kapoor and finally from my co moderator gerald because uh, in addition to being uh, the co moderator of the session he is also a representative of the world bank that's money bags uh, mr rahul uh, kapoor uh, would you like to say something about how uh, you know on the one hand you could probably nudge cities with some money to do the right things but how do you also make sure that the reform agenda happens that the sticks happen as well as the carrots please in fact you are absolutely right incentives are very important even with regard to the previous questions about how to change the priorities of the government now if you look at it how the automobile industries has been built over the years and the kind of stakes that are involved the gdp share of nearly 8% and considering that 1.3 million people are invo involved in this industry building incentives into the system by focusing on public infrastructure is one way to gradually shift over something which happened in london that over the years as the public infrastructure became really strong uh, so the number of registrations of private cars fell down and having the right kind of incentives right kind of uh, penalties in fact so that is the right balance uh, in basically having the push or the nudge to move towards active mobility towards non motorized transport and basically towards green mobility solutions and uh, currently like i said earlier because of this opportunity that has come due to covid this is a time to reprioritize we know that right now there is a huge gap 
with regard to commuting, with regard to available safe uh, and sustainable modes of transportation. So I think that nudge and push can happen by aligning it with the current situation. And I think uh, that would be the right way to move forward. Okay. Um, I'd just like to, again, you know, push uh, in that front because, you know, we've seen in, in, in UK, for example, the national government said, yes, we will bail out uh, London, TFL, but they also said you have to increase your congestion price. So that's a, you know, it's a precondition, right? It's not as if you're just getting a bailout, but you're also getting, uh, you know, you're required to do something in return to make sure that you're heading in the right direction. So we hope that uh, both at the national level uh, from Mohua as well as at the state level that we would get those kinds of actions coming through. Uh, <laughs> final words, Gerald, uh, from uh, the bank's perspective, what is it that the bank can do uh, beyond giving money? Can you push for a reform agenda? Well, actually, I would almost put it in reverse. I mean, our focus is always as a development bank, uh, not to give money, but really to think about the transformation that needs to take place for things to work differently. Um, I, one thing I would like to say, since uh, Prasanna couldn't join us back, he said the power cut in his neighborhood, uh, is that the private sector, the private bus operators that operate 30 crore or 300 million trips per day before COVID are really being impacted big time. And they, they simply cannot run the buses at half capacity. So the type of message that Mohamed mentioned about you know, new research in Singapore that's tried to understand the impact of social distancing and, and you know, how to manage it are very important to monitor closely to reflect in the reality of the market because we know there is a big undersupply of bus services in India compared to the size of your population. Uh, and there is a need accordingly to, uh, to ensure that that limited capacity is not cut by half uh, needlessly. The second thing is, um, and it came a number of times, ultimately we need to really think about what type of service we want the bus and the walkability uh, pathways we are creating to deliver to Indians uh, you know, within the next few years. Uh, when I was based in Singapore uh, just you know, two years ago, I, I would take the bus uh, almost on a daily basis and everybody would. Uh, why? Because the quality of service is not for those who cannot uh, afford anything else. It's the, the basic quality of service is good enough for everybody to, to use uh, buses. And I think what, when you look at well-performing cities, you will find that this is uh, what uh, they have managed to achieve, of course, by investing some resources. Now, before investing resources, there's one thing that has not come out too much, but is quite critical. Very certainly efficiency gains that can be squeezed in terms of the way systems are being operated. Uh, we estimate, you know, based on the number of states where we have been working, 15, 20, 25% efficiency gain can be achieved. So then your money becomes much more effective as you move forward. Then coming to the funding and financing question, uh, there's certainly a, 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 a term that is uh, favored by economists, which is uh, integrate, I mean, the internalization of externality, which you know, in plain term means, you know, a bus or a, a bike or a, a, a car have very different impact on the surrounding environment in terms of the space they consume, the uh, carbon emission they emit, the pollution, the safety impact, etc. So pricing that is what leads cities to be more sustainable. And what it means is also an opportunity to rethink about allocation within the sector in ways that reflect this, as well as raising additional resources to, uh, to capture the, the costs imposed by some of the other options, and then transfer it back to the most stable options. So that's part of the reform, nudge, and push that one can uh, think through as you try to transform uh, the cities. Uh, so, you know, uh, last but not least, uh, what to do now? I think aside from ensuring that you have a uh, safe bus from a standard operating procedure point of view, really thinking about how you spread uh, traffic uh, across time, how you crowd in some of the private bus operator during peak hours to uh, augment the limited capacity that is in place from the uh, public uh, bus services could be options to be considered in addition to 
a rapid large-scale investment in non-motorized transport uh, facility. So with those few words, I would like also to thank really the, a fantastic panel, uh, as well as Shreya for uh, sharing their insights. It's, uh, it's a lot to take, and, uh, but we really value uh, all these, uh, these inputs and uh, you know, new ideas that you shared with us today. Sure, thanks, Gerald. Uh, and before we end the session, uh, we have two polls, two short polls uh, to go. Uh, Venu, can you uh, put the first poll on? Uh, sure, Shreya. Uh, so as you can see, the question is, how optimistic are you of a green recovery in the Indian transport sector now after you've been part of the session? You've heard some great words from all our panelists. Uh, you know, some of them are from the government in India. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Mezgani is from an association of many multiple public and non-public bus operators and, and public transportation operators, uh, as well as uh, the bank, uh, Gerald, my colleague, and Dabu from GIZ. So if you think you're fairly optimistic, rate a five. If you think, no, this is not gonna happen, rate a one or something in between. How many responses have we gotten, Venu? Um, Shreya, we have around 66 percentage uh, of the attendees right now who have voted, and we could. Okay. I'll close another five room. seconds. Sure. With that, I'm ending the poll. Okay. With that, you could close and show us the results. Sure. Okay. So we have a lot of people in the middle um, who are unsure of whether they're optimistic or not so optimistic. But uh, overall, I'd say the score is a little above three rather than a little below three. Uh, and therefore, maybe we, uh, we should be a little optimistic. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but let's keep pushing. Let's make sure that we have a green recovery rather than, rather than a gray recovery. Uh, so with that, we bring this session to an end. I'd like to thank all the panelists who are there today. Thank you very much for being there. But I'd also like to uh, thank my team. Uh, thank you, Ashwati, Shiva, Archana, Venu, Aishwarya, and the entire team at the ITDP India program who've done uh, a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that this webinar series is working and happening. Um, so thanks a lot. And thank you, uh, uh, the World Bank team, Gerald, you, and Nupur and also uh, Laku and the GIZ team for making this happen. And last but not the least, uh, without your support, Mr. Kapoor uh, from the Smart Cities mission, this series would not have happened. So thank you for that support and thank you for your uh, strong commitment to make sure that Indian cities have the capacity to make sure that they create a green recovery. Let's make sure that that result of optimism, which was at 3.5, is at a five. Thank you. And with that, we come to an end of the session. There's a small little poll at the end of how you think this session went and how would you rate the quality of this webinar. And uh, the second question that we have is, would you recommend this session or this webinar series to other colleagues and friends? Many of you would probably have already gotten a mailer to register for the next session. So if you thought these sessions have been good, please do register and join us back and make sure that others you know who might be interested also join these sessions. Uh, We're also happy to listen to you about what you think about these sessions and what we could address in these sessions. Uh, thanks a lot for this course. And one last question about whether you would like to recommend this series to others.
Freya, I've shared the results as well that has come in. Thank um, you. Thanks a lot. So that's a that's a very positive result. Uh, we have 84% of people, more than 84%, saying that they would uh, that they've rated this either a four or five. Uh, thank you very much for uh, participating. Thank you, Shreya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye.